Uh, hello, everyone. This is the Gaming and Ad Online Conference, and um, I'm uh, still getting familiar here with Blackboard Collaborate, but enjoying it very much. Thanks to those that are in the chat, those of you listening to the recording later. Uh, I'm Sean Vickers, and we're going to talk about Teacher Craft, the amazing teachers using Minecraft in the classroom. This was formerly named Good Kung Fu, um, and we focused a little bit on how do we talk about games for learning, which we'll cover a little bit at the beginning. But the more I got into that topic, the more I really wanted to talk about um, what we're seeing in classrooms with teachers using um, tools, especially Minecraft. So we're going to talk about that a little bit today and move through that. Before we get started, um, I want to point out that the hashtag for this event, the entire event, is Gaming and Ed 14. Uh, and you can uh, tweet there. I think especially with online conferences, the more we're doing that or putting out posts around all of the events, uh, the more um, the ideas get shared and the more we can talk about these ideas as a community of people. Um, so uh, we have a few sponsors, BrainPop, ASB Ac Online Academy, um, and uh, Blackboard Collaborate and the Learning Revolution Project, which we have Steve Hargadon with us. Did I say your last name right, Steve? You did. <laughs> um, and we want to thank those people for, for putting this on and for, for organizing and, and funding this. Uh, we need those kinds of folks to help us out. Um, so, um, maybe my, uh, I don't quite know what this is and we didn't really talk about it. It looks like this is gathering where everyone's from in the world. Uh, so let's uh, turn on the whiteboard permission. So look to the, people look to the left of the map. There's a set of icons, you're looking for the star icon, double click on that, and then you can click on the map to indicate where you're participating from. There we go, there's some stars. We're primarily in North America, it looks like. That's great. All right, so we're going to yeah, talk about. To move on. Yeah, we're going to talk about. Yeah, I just thought that was interesting. <laughs> so we're going to talk today about uh, teacher craft, uh, amazing teachers using Minecraft in the classroom. Really, what I'm going to talk about today is about four to five years worth of research, um, really poking at the question of. I, I guess I'm interested in um, the question: Are games good for learning? For me, is fairly answered. Um, and where I think the interesting research is happening right now is how, how do games get integrated into classrooms? And how exactly does that process happen? And the more we can learn about that process, I think the more we'll see games get used in a classroom. Um, and, and in absence of knowing something robust about that topic, the danger that we have is that we are presenting professional development or we're asking teachers to do things that we simply haven't trained them for at any point in their career. And I think that's a, an awkward place to be as a community. So as researchers, politicians, business agencies gather together around these ideas of what students should be learning in the classroom today, I'm really curious about how do teachers learn and how do they approach new technologies and new ideas. And I've been interested in that for some time. Um, so very quickly, I'll go through kind of the, the why games. Why do, we, why do we talk about games and why do we uh, look at games in the first place? The place I'm coming from is I want to define games real quick. For me, when I say games, that's a very loose term in, in most conversations. So let's narrow that down just a little bit. For me, games are a consistent and a persistent attribute of human culture and learning for youth. Um, so how do we define those? First of all, I think games involve play. That's a capital P play. And play is a voluntary explorative activity around something where a person has an internally compelled story or challenge. In other words, as soon as we make a game an assignment in a classroom, by definition, I think it's no longer a game. It's an assignment or a task. But games are something that people do because they want to, because they have a goal that they've built up, and they do it voluntarily and during their kind of free and interstitial times. That said, games are a form of play which has everything to do with learning. They seamlessly integrate with the digital media and the digital setting because we can put much more into that experience than just an imagination. We can actually combine the imagination of the player 
and the designer of the game. And we can mix visuals and audios and put those together. So unlike pretending on the playground that I'm an action spy, with a digital game, I can pretend I'm an, I, I can depend I'm an international spy, or I can pretend I'm an international spy um, with the help of visuals and audios that a designer would put together. I think that's fairly robust. Um, Another aspect of digital games as a form of play or a, a, a way that we play, I look at digital games as um, having an integrated rule book. And by that I mean if we looked at older games, board games, and, and even sports, um, they tend to come with a rule book. There's a set of confined rules that we give to a player, and you have to learn the rules before you play, or everyone else playing the game gets irritated that you don't know the rules. In digital games, we can constrain the space by building it with certain mechanics or certain attributes or certain verbs that the player can have. So either they can run or they can't run. And we don't have to give them a rule book telling them how to move. We can just give them those permissions within a digital space. So I think digital spaces are particularly interesting because instead of having to learn the rules before you play, we're seeing more and more games come out with smaller and smaller rule books and some without any rule book because you can embed those rules into the constraints of the space or the world. So that's fairly interesting for me. The Good Kung Fu part of this is a longer discussion that has to do with rhetoric. And I, and I want to address that just for a minute or two before we go on with Minecraft. I think that in the community of people that, and I think we're all on the same team, I'm seeing more and more people that want to define that all games are good for learning, that all games are somehow relevant for classroom use. But when I hear that presented to teachers, I, there's a lot of pushback there because teachers define learning very differently than researchers who look at learning across contexts. Within a classroom context, a teacher has an obligation towards a curriculum. So when you say the word learning with a teacher, um, they're thinking of their curriculum that they have to teach. So when I present a game that has little to no connection to the curricular obligations of the teacher, a statement like all games are good for learning actually alienates one community from the other. And I think that that's what I would call out of balance. I use the term Kung Fu on this in a chapter that's coming out in a Minecraft book because when I was a kid, I watched these Saturday Kung Fu theater movies. And most of these movies, the Kung Fu was about the balance that you had. So there were people with good Kung Fu and bad Kung Fu, and it wasn't necessarily connected to a moral stance, right? So there were people with good Kung Fu that, had, that were out of balance was the sign of evil and bad Kung Fu. And those that had balance or a balanced way of life had good Kung Fu. And it wasn't necessarily their physical attributes. It was more of their emotion, emotional and ethical attributes that formed the Kung Fu. In the same way, when we talk about games, I think we need to be really careful to stay in balance. When we make sweeping statements like, you know, all schools have to teach 21st century skills, or all games are good for learning, or the world is changing under our feet as we're speaking. Those are very out-of-balance statements, and they're things that I think actually make the conversation more difficult for people like me that talk to teachers on a regular basis. Um, because they're looking at the same curriculum they had to teach last year, and that curricular change happens in a different place than in the classroom. It happens at the state level or at the district level. So those conversations are valid. I think, again, we're all on the same team. But I would, I would caution what I have to say here, saying I don't know that all games are good for particular curricular teaching and learning that teachers have to do. In other words, if a teacher is teaching geography, there might be some games that are much more relevant for that geography class than other games. And, I, and that discernment, that balance that we would have when we talk about games, I think is relevant. There's very few teachers where what they are assigned to teach is 21st century skills, but there are some. That said, I don't make the argument that all games are good for particular classroom learning. I do make the argument that some games are especially good, and we can usually find games that are relevant to every classroom, K through 12, higher ed, subject areas, and even those kinds of things for special needs and not special needs. We have such a robust library of digital gaming experiences now that for teachers not to know which ones are relevant for the classroom is a level of uh, um, just kind of not knowing your profession. So I think instead of saying all games are good for learning to our teachers, I think we should say you need to find the games that are good for your subject area. And there are, out, there are games out there. Let me help you find those games. 
So when they look at those sorts of things, uh, we have good balance when we make our arguments and we're actually presenting meaningful things. That said, I do make the argument that Minecraft is good for learning. So when, I, when we look at Minecraft, we're looking at a very particular game. I, I have a shot of one of the opening scenes from Minecraft. For those of you that aren't familiar with Minecraft as a game, uh, let me just kind of walk you through real quick. First of all, just this week, Minecraft was purchased for $2.5 billion by Microsoft. So we're not talking about a tiny game or a, 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 an independent game even anymore. Mojang started out as an independent company, and it was really a, 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 an online character, Notch, uh, and I'll use the name he prefers. But Notch decided to make a world where you could move and change anything, and, you, and the whole world was interactive. So as you see these kind of highly pixelated blocks on the screen, those are all blocks you can pick up, put in your inventory, modify them, and set them down somewhere else. So truly, as I look at this landscape, I'm trying to think about where I want to build something. Or those leaves on the tree might drop seeds. Or those little uh, flowers in the field down there. I can pick those flowers up and make a flower bed outside of my house. Um, I can use the water over in the distance and I can combine that with other things. I can freeze that water. The sand off in the distance, I can bake it and make glass. So there's this little alchemy uh, attribute to Minecraft with this ability to do anything you want that makes Minecraft especially interesting as educators. So we're, not all games are necessarily curricularly relevant. Minecraft is, and, and here's why. Um, Minecraft is what I would call a sandbox game or a building block game in this case. Uh, most of us play with Legos, and the primary restraint of Legos is how many you own. So I have to stop building when I run out of Legos as a kid. With Minecraft, um, that there's unlimited Legos. All of these little blocks can be mixed and matched and redone. And ultimately, for me as a, a former Lego maniac, this creates a world that I just get sucked into because I can build anything and I never run out of blocks. Um, and I don't have to mix and match the block colors. I can, I can get unlimited blocks in the color I want them. All I need to do is spend time and go pick them up. So with that invested time combined with an unlimited set of options, we have a game that's really constrained only by imagination. In that sense, this is a unique media. I don't even know if this is properly called a game at that point because we don't have those set goals or challenges other than what the player creates. So by my definition, if we trust that players are intelligent, an intelligent player will come into this space and they'll set their own goal. I want to put a building in the middle of that flat area. So they immediately conceive and perceive their own game goals. And in that sense, it's a game that trusts that the player has intelligence, that a person will walk in here with an imagination. Now for kids, this is like imagination crack cocaine. This is amazing for them. And kids will drop into Minecraft, millions of kids drop into Minecraft, and they play this kind of thing all the time. Um, parents will complain to me and say, why can I not get my kid off Minecraft? And my explanation to them is, do you remember when you played with Legos? What if you could get as many as you want? Would you have left the room? And the answer is usually no, I probably would have done Legos. So parents are learning how to teach their kids social skills, how to teach their kids digital restraint in this kind of a space, because it's ultimately the kind of space where you can play forever. In that sense, it's a great sandbox. You can do whatever you want within the constraints and the, the abilities that the game designer allows you to have. Every part of this world is an interactive, and, and it, for me, that creates a blank slate. So I look at a blank slate literally like in, in uh, 1800s classrooms. Kids were assigned a piece of slate that they could write anything they wanted on, and they generally did their work with the teacher on that piece of slate. Um, more recently, we use paper, and a blank sheet of paper can be really used in any way you want to by a teacher. So when someone says, well, how do I apply this to a geography class, a great answer to that, I think a good balanced answer to that is, well, how do you use paper in your geography class? Because the game isn't a set of facts or a set of things to memorize. It will not teach your child anything outside of a designed constraint by, by the student or by the teacher. Just like a piece of paper or a blank piece of slate or a wide open whiteboard, nothing happens here educationally unless the player or the teacher sets a goal for themselves and brings some understanding. So I think that that's fairly interesting. Now, this resulted, of course, in kind of uh, 
looking forward as to well, what do we do with, where do we go from there? So um, the first place to go is to try it out. And, and I'll suggest that, that if you haven't played Minecraft, that this conversation gets to be a lot easier to follow when you do it. This is the first house I ever built in Minecraft. And you can see it's basically a sod house. Uh, we've built into the side of the hill, my two kids and I. You can see I put one little flower outside the door. The initial efforts in Minecraft for any adult that's new to it is going to be fairly rudimentary. And for some adults, that's scary because the kids are producing better product than you are. Um, and I would suggest that just like when you first learn to draw with crayons on a piece of paper, your first drawings are fairly weak. What happens over time is every time you draw a picture, you think of the next thing you want to do next time you try it. So for those of you that haven't tried or gone and played, um, here's how you start. Uh, and I'll make it real simple. There's a, there's a, um, a web link on my page, minecraft.gamepedia.com. Uh, and just do a search there for tutorials. This isn't the only place where you can find day one Minecraft tutorials, um, but it's definitely a place to start with this. In the meantime, I'm going to go on and, and talk a little bit about how teachers learn. But I think one of the first things for teachers, if we're going to use games in the classroom, we as teachers need to learn to play again. And teachers that don't know how to play have a real hard time figuring out how to use this media in their classroom. But that doesn't diminish the media itself. The game itself is a powerful tool, just like paper, just like slate, just like a giant whiteboard. It's the teacher that needs to think of ways to use that in their classroom that's innovative and interesting. Um, uh, Sharon's putting an idea in the chat, which I would totally agree with. If you want to go play and you know someone that plays Minecraft, and it's hard to not find an elementary or middle school kid that hasn't played Minecraft, um, ask them to play with you. Stay after school and have them show you around. They'll they have a natural sense of how to put you at ease. So when you fall in a pit and you can't figure out how to get out, they'll show you how, and they'll make it real easy and low bandwidth. You as a teacher have to be humble enough to take direction from a student, though, to do that. So I would suggest that you find someone to play with. You go search a tutorial, and you have them walk you through it. Um, in essence, again, it's just a big, wide open space. So a lot of people new to Minecraft that I've seen, even students, will say, what do I do here? And generally, I see that as an indicator that they, their imagination isn't quite working. Uh, we've broken it in some way, shape, or form. Um, so encouraging them or giving them some ideas as to what to try, where to go, can be another way to kind of encourage people that are new to Minecraft. You may experience the same thing. You may look at a wide open world and not know what to do next. And I would suggest try to build yourself a house so when nighttime comes, you can hide out um, and, and you'll get there. So that's Minecraft. The next part of what I want to talk about are these amazing teachers I deal with. And I'm, I'm running into more and more as I work with districts and do professional development and training with districts. Um, the difference between who teachers are and how we perceive them as researchers and as administrators and as district level um, personnel, I've, there's some different paradigms about what a teacher is. And frankly, teachers aren't controlling that conversation very well right now. And I think that's part of the friction we feel in our country is that we aren't defining teachers commonly. Um, and I think there's three views that I've seen. Uh, the first is um, those that view teachers as employees. And if teachers are employees, it makes a lot of sense to tell them what to do and expect that they'll do it. So when we say we want students to learn critical thinking skills, all we need to do for an employee is have a big staff meeting and tell them, you need to integrate critical thinking into your curriculum. And then good employees will go off and do that. Um, that isn't happening. And a lot of the research on professional development, professional support, is showing constraints and barriers and teacher resistance to that model. And I would suggest that we don't have teachers that are resistant. We just have teachers that aren't employees, or that's not how they see themselves. The second option is guardians. And this is often a, a viewpoint that I see in academia or theorists. We'll picture that, well, perhaps teachers aren't trying out digital games in the classroom because they're guardians of a culture. And they can't afford to spend time learning every new technology that comes out and every whim and, and passing thing. So people that have this viewpoint tend to, to look at what's going on in education right now, and they frame it as um, a revolving door of ideas. So there was outcome-based education and differentiated instruction and project-based learning. Um, and now we're looking at data-based instruction and data-based decision-making. 
Um, we're looking at standardization, common core curriculum. And these to the guardian type thinker thinks that, well, teachers need to, in part, be able to close their classroom door and do what they please because they're guardians of something, our kids. Um, so it's a good thing that they still have the ability to resist. But again, like with employees, this creates a paradigm where we're looking at teachers as resistors. And, and it's not what I see when I talk to teachers. And, and instead, um, I see designers. And so when you talk to teachers, uh, at least teachers that are trying digital media in the classroom, they see themselves as designers of learning experiences. If we look at teachers as designers, that changes the paradigm a little bit. If teachers are designers, then we would expect to see that they won't all learn the same way. They'll have learning styles just like students do. They won't design the same way. They'll have different approaches to conceiving an idea, moving through an idea, and then bringing it to a refinement or refining that idea. And that's common. Um, the third thing that we should expect to see when we see designers is that designers will pick and choose what they're looking for but they're always picking and choosing. When you look at teachers as designers and we say you need to teach critical thinking, a designer will accept that and say, okay, but they'll approach it very differently than what we present to them because designers want to do things differently. If a student has seven different classes in a day in a typical high school, if every teacher taught the exact same way, they would all become pretty tedious. Good designers think, how can I grab students' attention with something new, something different, or an, a, a different approach to something? So a lot of the designers I talk to are actually doing that. They're finding ways to engage students that are completely unique, and it has everything to do with the local culture, the district culture, the state culture, and even the national culture of education. A good designer looks for new ways to engage. They don't necessarily adopt best practices as we tell them. So in that model or that theoretical framework, we don't see teachers that resist anymore. We see teachers that are designing all the time. But that changes professional development. If I have employees or guardians, I can have a staff meeting, do an in-service training with them, and they'll do exactly what we tell them to do because they're good employees or they're good guardians. And if they're not, we should fire them or find ways to fire them because they're not good. If I instead, as, a, as an educational leader or an administrator, look at my teachers as designers, when we get into a staff meeting, I can tell them what to do, but my expectation is they'll all go do it differently. And if that's the case, then I don't have bad teachers in the room. I have good designers. And they're not resisting a new initiative. They're actually supporting that initiative, but doing it in creative and new ways. In my research, where I look at exemplary teachers or, or um, teachers that are doing just that, that's what I see. I see teachers that are designing or creating new things. It looks something like this. And I use an approach that's kind of being refined by psychologist Dan McAdams at Northwestern University. I'm a fanboy of McAdams because he looks at life narratives. And he treats a person's story as a data unit within that narrative, for instance. Uh, if I use an ink blot test and show that to you and you tell me what you see, I'm getting a little glimpse as to how you think. I'm, I'm seeing inside your world a little bit. I think an ink, ink blot is a fairly simple tool that doesn't get used as much anymore by psychologists, but a life narrative is a robust tool that does get used. So instead of showing you an ink blot, I can simply ask you to tell me about how you got to that new classroom idea. And what I'm going to start to see is an emergent pattern of behaviors and thought processes that look much more like designers than employees. And here's the four steps that I see across the cases. This is from two different studies. The first study was of 32 teachers that um, were award-winning teachers. So teachers of the year, writing project teachers, being award winners. Um, presidential award winners, and um, uh, national writing workshop teachers. So there was 32 of them, and we interviewed all of them, basically asking the question, how did you get from wanting to be a teacher to using the ideas that you use today as an expert teacher? And then we let them tell their stories. The stories they chose to tell to give that full narrative account tells us something about these teachers. And the stories fell into four patterns, validation, experimentation, appropriation, and refinement. The second study, I focused particularly on Minecraft for two reasons. One, Minecraft is what I would say, see as this very blank slate space. Like I explained, I want to know what teachers did with a piece of paper when they first got cheap and affordable paper. Well, now that they have a cheap and affordable digital world to play in, 
what are our maverick early adopting teachers doing with that space? And the, the bulk of the rest of this talk is going to be to share those ideas with you and show you what they're doing with that space. So these amazing teachers are interesting to me. Uh, we looked at 17 Minecraft teachers and again 32 of the award winning teachers. And, and in each case we saw exactly this pattern that's on the screen right now. Um, and this is where, again, we broke down the study. So when we look at teachers, I want to look at how they validate the idea. So what I mean by that is when you first hear about Minecraft or any other digital tool, um, teachers don't appropriate it immediately. So you might hear of a hundred different things, but a good designer will find the one that interests them, and that's what makes its way into the classroom. So what does validation look like exactly? How do they validate? What are the sources that validate a new piece of technology that actually makes it into a classroom? I know this from the research, it is not in-service training. That is not the prompt that gets our designing teachers to actually do new things in the classroom. Second, experimentation. I want to know what it looks like when teachers are playing with an idea, and usually these teachers would do something before they brought it into the classroom. So they would test an idea or a new technology in some way, shape, or form. Appropriation is how they first try it out in the classroom. But after they tried in the, out in the classroom, every one of these teachers would refine their idea. They would do something different. Now, a good employer will do what they're told, and you wouldn't expect to see refinement from a good employee. You wouldn't expect to see appropriation from a good guardian. But if you have designers, you would expect to see both appropriation and refinement as an ongoing iterative process with the teacher. And that was the case with every one of these teachers. And it's not often in research uh, when you're looking at uh, you know, 49 different cases that you can say that it was consistent across all 49. So for those of you that are quantitative, I would call that statistically significant data. So here's what it looks like. When you pull these stories out and you start looking at these, I just want to give you a glimpse inside. Where do people validate from? And what I found was that validation actually occurred usually in the spaces of hobbies or interest spaces. And it came from everywhere. It wasn't just digital gamers that brought digital games into the classroom. We had a fly fisherman that started to bring in digital fly fisherman activities into his classroom. We had people that did yoga, and it was simply the place where they thought about their classroom ideas. So here's a question that's interesting. Do principals and administrators ask their teachers to get involved in hobbies that, that are different or outside their curriculum? And the reality is we have a lot of pressure right now here in Ohio for teachers to be practicing or getting their master's degree in their subject area. We call it highly qualified teacher status. And it's coming straight from a national initiative to push that. However, the data shows that it's not necessarily within your subject area that you get great ideas to refine and bring new content into your, into your teaching. Uh, so that's, that's one of those kinds of things. Uh, notice the last two quotes. We saw a few teachers really express this clearly, that they were always looking for ideas in everything they do, in everything. And they would repeat themselves um, in their discourse because they were emphasizing that point. Um, again, that fits better with a paradigm that has teachers as designers, which is interesting to me. So here's what it looks like when you look at the data. And as we converted from uh, PowerPoint to Collaborate, it looks like they messed up my columns a, a tid, tad bit. But this is interesting because as validation happens in gaming spaces and conference spaces, when you look at the activity that directly precedes a decision to use a tool in the classroom, notice how the percentages shift and change. When, when I, so this is what this might look like in a story. Um, I would hear about Minecraft at a conference or an online conference like this. I, wow, there's this game that this Dickers guy is talking about. I'm kind of interested in that. But that's not what makes the decision to use it in my classroom. What I'll do is I'll take that game and I'll go play it myself or I'll show it to some students after school and say, hey, what do you think of this game? And I'll just sit back and watch my students play it. So close to half of the time across these teachers, that's exactly what would happen. A teacher would hear about something, and then they would try it with their students. When we know that sort of thing, that should change how we design teacher professional development and support. Do we hold professional development sessions at the district level where students and teachers get to do things together? And that's an interesting question, because if that's where innovative teaching and idea generation actually happens, that's an easy thing to organize and set up as a district. So that's why I get really geeked out about this kind of research. I want to know where these things happen. Another place where they would do it in the, in the yellow ones, in 18 and 12% um, 
uh, interestingly enough, for designers, they don't all do it the same way. So we saw these kind of four habits. The most prevalent was watching kids play. But I also think it's still relevant that almost 20% of these teachers would go online to find out more about something they heard about. And it was the online activity and reading other teachers' posts and forums or seeing uh, uh, game tutorials or watching those things happen. That's where they said, I think I'll try this in the classroom. I'll actually go use it and give it a go. Um, and then a trusted friend. How important relationships were in this research really stood out. So let's go back to Kung Fu. If we're thinking about approaching games for learning and having that conversation with our teachers and having a balanced approach to this discussion, instead of saying, here's a technology you should use, a la interactive whiteboards, video conferencing, um, email was back when I was first starting teaching, they wanted everyone to use email for good reason. Instead of that approach, can we be looking at having email training with kids present where they can show teachers how to use the technology? Can we make things more personal and intimate? Do we have to do school-wide training or can we do training with one, two, three teachers at a time, um, which is worth 30% of our teachers were learning when they did things independently? Can we trust our teachers on training days to go to their rooms and work on certain things that are interesting to them? Um, do we support online activity and trusted friendships and networks? And there's been some motion around trusted friend, which I would call the professional learning community movement. But if you look at some of the early writers around the professional learning workshops, uh, they thought it should be a voluntary gathering of people that would read through books together, try new technologies together. And what's happened in schools is that districts will mandate a professional learning community. As soon as you mandate it, it's no longer playful or game-like. It's now a task or an activity that some teachers are going to naturally think is a waste of their time. But they'll go to the PLC because it's their job, where that's really a, a, a valuable process for at least 12% of my teachers. Let's keep going. So how might we look at uh, what teachers do when they first try a game like Minecraft in the classroom? So what do they actually do after they make the decision to use it? And here's a little glimpse inside that world. Let's start with uh, this quote that came from the research uh, as a data point. Um, what we see going on here is that for new ideas in class, teachers report that they find ways to bounce ideas, and I'm using bounce ideas as a phrase that came out of the research interviews. They would bounce ideas off students first. So to try a new piece of software, they would do it before school, during their breaks. They would use the lunch hour to have students in their classroom during lunch period. Uh, or they would have times after school or even start their own after school club. There's a teacher named Zach Gilbert that has turned the after school club into a fine art, where when he sees new interesting technology, immediately brings it to this group of tech students that hang out after school, and they test and practice ways to use it in the classroom as an after school club. And this is a formalization of something that was consistent across teacher professional development that they gave themselves, which was this process of testing an idea. I'm going to call that the Petri dish. So you put new ideas into the Petri dish and you see what grows. Um, just like when you, not to compare computer games with mold, but I thought the image worked really well. The, the active products will grow when you put them in these test situations. They will refine themselves and show themselves to have potential. And that's where teachers would kind of see that. So the other aspect, which this quote points out to, is that effective teachers, these kind of innovative maverick teachers, I thought it was interesting that for them, failure was a good thing. So in this sense, they reflect the thinking patterns of good gamers, right? So a good gamer loves to fail, because the more you fail, the more you learn how to achieve. So failure in computer games today has a very low punishment level. When I played Pac-Man as a kid, if you died, you got three lives and the game was over. That's a high punishment level. But today, computer games have a very low punishment level. They take you back to a checkpoint. You just have to keep redoing the level until you figure it out. Great teachers are adapting the same practices. They're creating for themselves spaces where they can try new ideas in the classroom and fail as many times as they need in order to get deeper understanding from that activity. So when you say to a teacher, try Minecraft in the classroom, and they go try it, and, and the network doesn't work, the students don't know what to do, the teacher's uncomfortable, they'll walk away from that digital technology and they'll never use it again because as a designer, they're just not comfortable with that medium yet. 
It's like a, a person that uses watercolors trying to go to oils. If you're not comfortable with the medium, you just won't try things in that medium. Or when you do try things and it doesn't work out like you imagined, you'll walk away from it forever. So a better, more balanced approach to talking to teachers is to say, don't try this in your classroom yet. You've never played the game yourself. Don't try things in the classroom you haven't tried yourself. Go give it a go or try it out with a student. Do something after school. Put yourself in a space where when you fail, it doesn't destroy an entire class period. And build familiarity with the media by playing with the media first. In other words, what, what I would recommend to teachers in a more balanced approach is the same advice that gamers give to each other. Relax, take it easy, it's okay to die a few times. Um, the point is to achieve or to overcome that next boss that's down the road for you. So that petri ditch approach uh, to me looks, looks more interesting than a standard teacher professional development approach. Here's another way to look at it, open play. I like this quote, I don't mess with the magic too much. The further I move my lessons away from vanilla Minecraft, the further I'm getting away from something that millions of gamers know and love, and that's dangerous. I want to say that in this testing space, when teachers were trying things out, or the after-school club, when teachers use Minecraft in these spaces, um, they were kind of purists about the game. They figured the more you kind of insert curriculum into something like Minecraft, the more you ruin the actual root experience. Uh, so there's even other presenters at, the, at this virtual conference that feel very strongly that you don't colonize game spaces for kids. You enjoy them with kids, and the game itself has value. That's true. Minecraft itself is a, is a rich, robust space where a kid's imagination can, can do whatever, and they can work with other people and play with other people online at the same time. In the same way that as a parent, I'm going to provide my kid with reams of paper, I'm going to give them access to these kinds of digital spaces too, just for the fun of it and to experience that. So gamers would do the same kind of thing. Uh, and, and these effective teachers are actually practicing that kind of worldview. So that idea of using Minecraft as an open play space is, is, is um, a common one that we continue to see in the, the research. I can put on a little caveat there, though. The teachers that advocated for this, just bring kids to the computer lab and let them play, don't tell them what to do, that open play model was always in the case of after school settings. It was rare that a curriculum area teacher would advocate for that. Curriculum teachers all had a curriculum to cover. So when they were using Minecraft, they came up with other kinds of ideas, which we'll get to next. The other purpose of these after-school clubs was to watch students. Um, in the same way that a teacher can try things and fail on their own, or just let students do open play so they can generate ideas, they would do that by watching students. So they would also make little tweaks to the game, like this quote presents, um, where they would see a problem with the game with large groups of students, and they would adjust and fix that problem in these after-school spaces so that when they brought it into the classroom, they knew how to set up the server. And those are things, as you get into Minecraft, you'll see that you can change the settings on a server. You can have monsters or turn them off. You can have night and day happen, or you can shut that off. Um, you can give students unlimited blocks without having to go work for them, or you can shut that off and have vanilla Minecraft where they have to go dig up their own blocks. And there's various kinds of servers that are coming and going. Bucket just got shut down for a little bit. But you can go online and, and download whole worlds and servers, and those are all things you can do as you watch students. You'll find out that there's different things you can do to these digital spaces that are interesting. They'll teach you. Um, so um, Danny has a question in the chat. He says, how do you persuade overburdened teachers to commit the extra time to after club expectation? Here's the thing, Dan. You can't command a teacher to do an after school club. I mean, obviously, that's a volunteer activity. Most districts will pay for, for for people to do an after school club. So for an overburdened teacher, that it's also can be an extra paycheck if you organize one of these. Typically, if a teacher says, I'm overburdened and I don't have time to do an after school club, um, I wouldn't push on that. I would, I would respect the fact that they know their limits and where they're at. I did run into some teachers. There's three teachers in Canada that did an after school club together, and they rotated the supervision of that club. So when one of them needed to be gone, they would simply rotate who was covering the, the session that night. So that would be one idea to help with time management. The other piece is when I talk to these teachers um, 
to share their story with you well, I want to emphasize that for these teachers, this was the thing that saved them time. That this petri dish kind of thing was actually a, 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 a type of scientific method. It's where they could test an idea and see if it worked so that they didn't lose time when they went to the classroom. So for the teachers that did this, the reason they told these stories um, as part of their narrative is because they were essential to their classroom adoption and, and, and growing as, a, as, a, as an innovative teacher. Um, they wouldn't tell the stories if it wasn't part of the narrative. Um, so that's something where I have to just kind of suggest, A, don't push teachers that don't want to be pushed on this sort of thing. They're probably at a different place in their development. Um, suggest time management savers, like multiple teachers working together with an after-school club. And then finally, I think we need to advocate and share how important these spaces are, that if you don't do an after-school club, you should find time for personal play. You should find time for online surfing or discovery of ideas online. Or the, the, the last one, which was to be in, to be, have a trusted friend. So a teacher that doesn't consider themselves tech savvy can accommodate for that by having a friend that does. So instead of me knowing all the new applications that are out there, if I hang out at lunch with another teacher that does have fun doing that, um, I ran into award-winning teachers that said they could barely boot up their own computer, but they're using high-tech things in the classroom because they have a trusted friend that introduces things to them and a great IT coordinator that can help them set it up. So you don't have to be tech savvy to bring technology into your classroom. You don't even have to be a master gamer to bring a good computer game into the classroom. What you need is enough familiarity with the software to know how you want to use it as a teacher. I don't have to write on a piece of paper to have my students write on a piece of paper, but I do need to give them some direction as to what I'm looking for when they write on that piece of paper. So the other piece is looking for moments of opportunity, especially with teachers that kind of have these open play spaces. The way they taught is they would mill about the room looking for opportunities to, to hook a kid in on something and to build a kind of challenge for that teacher. So. Um, I'm going to go on and kind of show you what that looks like as to what a moment of opportunity would look like. A good game has some sort of goal or challenge that's put in front of the player. With Minecraft, that's fairly abstracted. So a teacher can come in and set a goal or a challenge for a student. Um, this would not be the open play. The open play people would disagree with this. But the curricular area teachers would say, yes, this is where I was able to teach using Minecraft in the classroom. I could present a goal or a challenge to students, and they could playfully go about figuring out how to do it. So small constraints at the beginning lead to a wide variety of projects and applications, because students will blow your mind when you give them a little freedom to do that. So this is what that looked like in the data. Um, Teachers would try things out, test them out in those spaces, but when they appropriated it for the classroom, they would make decisions like this, where they choose to put in a little structure, and then they would start to create a border around a space, and then they would tell them what to do. This teacher created a very constrained activity, which is not native to Minecraft. They actually built a giant castle in the game and then logged their students in. The amount of prep time this takes is staggering. So for teachers without time, this is not the way I would use Minecraft in the classroom, but this teacher swore by it, that when they set something up for students, students could come in and try to figure it out, that the students really engaged, and they were motivated by that activity. And in figuring out the puzzle, they were actually learning classroom content. So that's making a challenge. That's another way to use Minecraft in the classroom. Here's another large example of that. Eric Walker, um, uh, uses or built an entire world for students to explore that was based on his social studies classroom. So he would tell students which number on the map that they were going to visit that day, and this would carry students throughout an entire geography curriculum where they could go walk around the Colosseum, which you can kind of see on the map there, and they could see it for themselves. And the amount of time, he's been working years on this sort of thing. The good news is you can download the whole world, and if you're a social studies teacher, this is something you can use in the classroom. So making a world or making a challenge would fall under a category that I would say the teacher does the design work ahead of time, and then students come into that space and interact with it. Um, that would lend with making a world or building an entire world, too. But that's not the only way teachers used it in the classroom. Another approach is to design with your students. So the goal in this kind of space is not to 
tell students what they're supposed to learn. It's to create an experience that fosters or cultivates an area or an objective that the teacher wants to be talking about or in and with. Um, so here's what that looks like. Uh, here's a basic idea where they had been reading a book called Lord of the Flies in the middle school, at the middle school level. And they said, what if I put our students on an island and ask them to kind of survive on the island, and which is very native to Minecraft. That's not hard to do. You just open up a random world, find an island, and then you port all your students to that island and say, go. So very little prep time as opposed to creating a whole world for your students. But the students kind of navigate the space and build the world for themselves. In this case, the role of the teacher was to simply make a narrative. James G. talks about this with um, the, the Sims, where the player-created narrative actually forms the constraint. So one example that he gives is a single mom that was try that posted a set of rules saying, if you want to try The Sims, play by these rules and you'll know what it's like to be a single mom. Um, and a whole community of people formed around that single narrative. So I would say that creating a narrative is one way that a teacher can use a digital tool in the classroom very effectively, simply by changing the rules a little bit as a classroom agreement and then using the designer's rules that are embedded in the game, you can have whole sorts of narratives. This, by the way, this idea took off for this teacher. And they started to partner with the teacher that was using the book in their classroom, the social studies teacher, because they started doing civics as they moved forward, um, and how to do con conflict re resolution. So they were building social skills with this idea. Uh, here's another example of making a narrative, or another way to talk about it. When you make a narrative as a teacher, one thought is to make a hook. And here, in this example, the hook was uh, students that loved Batman Arkham Asylum. So once you find what a student loves, and this just goes beyond digital gaming, once you find what a student loves, it's not hard to use that hook to build that relationship and then move them towards actual realities. So asylums are real, and they're all across this country. Every state on the eastern seaboard got an asylum assigned to them. Today, most of them are closed down and falling apart. So that's the lure is to tell the student, do you know that what you see in Batman actually has some reality, that there are haunted asylums all over the country? And then here's the truth. Um, you can go to a place like Minecraft, which is a blank piece of paper, and have them use what they've learned in, the rea in their research to actually build it for you in Minecraft. So this is an example of two students that researched asylums across the country and tried to build the asylum for Minecraft, integrating all of the kinds of rooms and spaces you would have. So this asylum has a ballroom in the middle, a greenhouse in the back, which was common for these asylums. It has offices and, and, and lavish facilities for the nurses and doctors, and the two wings to either side, male and female, have these small little cells built up. This is a four-story building that is completely functional on the inside. It took these students weeks of weekend and night times to do it, and all of that time was spent on topic and on task to learn more about it. Another way to approach using Minecraft in the classroom that came out of the research was a design challenge. This has the lowest level of teacher prep, but the highest level of student work. So instead of telling them what to build, you tell them what the challenge is. So you would say to them, in this case, build an eco-friendly city um, that um, is well insulated using water. And this is one student's response to that. She was 13 years old when she made this. But this is a city that insulates itself and heats and cools appropriately. Um, so a design challenge is one way to do that. Here's another one. Uh, build the digestive system. And this was done in the science class. Uh, behind, uh, this isn't uh, moving forward. Behind this is the outside of an entire digestive system. You can kind of see the esophagus and colon on either side. But you could go through the digestive system by hit, getting on a railroad car and walking your way through it. At various points, the students put up signs to show what was where and and what was inside that system. So there's, I think, another great idea. From here forward, we're going to wrap up in the next five minutes. Most of these are just show and tell as to what got done. Here's uh, Philadelphia. The design challenge is build colonial Philadelphia. And a whole class got to take part on that. Last, a last thought on this is that when teachers use Minecraft in the classroom, none of them saw themselves in isolation. There is a robust community of teachers online 
Um, last I saw it was in the hundreds, but I think it's get, getting close to being able to say it's in the thousands of teachers that are talking about ideas on how to use Minecraft in the classroom. And there's informal communities where they're still using it in a play space where they're doing some pretty amazing things which I think are relevant for learning. Uh, this is the, um, the Red Keep in Game of Thrones where they're trying to, a guild of Minecraft players are trying to build the world of games, games and thrones, a game, game of thrones, sorry, and they're trying to do it two scales. So when the book says they traveled three days, they would travel three Minecraft days and start building that, that next town. Here's another example. The Minecraft community also has apps and add-ons. So um, having students do art with graphic design kits on the left, there's another app called Minecraft Reality. Uh, where you can build things in Minecraft and pull those sprites out. So this is a pirate ship on the, on the mantle in my den. And then for Christmas, I put a creeper in the middle of our living room. Uh, so there's ways to use Minecraft that's interesting. I talked to two teachers that use these kinds of tools to do one did art shows where they'd have people come in and look at um, three-dimensional art, but they would put it in the room at scale. Uh, another one did the same thing in a gymnasium where they had their science fair in a gymnasium and students had the option of using a tool like Minecraft Reality. That's the name of the app, by the way. Um, and they would tape off areas of the floor that the um, augmented reality could use and they could show off their, their project within a three-dimensional space in a real gymnasium. So that's meaningful kind of teacher craft and what we're looking at. The other piece of, of Minecraft for education is teachers were using Minecraft to teach life lessons, like managing time, collaborating, organizing a team. So all of our teachers were concerned with these lessons. They're not curricular lessons, but they're things that great teachers seem to be tuned into. When they used a new activity in classroom, they wanted to know what it would teach kids beyond the curriculum. And Minecraft was effective at this because as soon as you put time in on something, there's an economy to it. It looks like this. When a student puts in time and ideas on any activity, that has some value. So if they come and show you a drawing that's done in crayon and they're excited about that drawing, it's because they put time and ideas into it. Regardless of how good that drawing looks, it has value and most parents kind of know that. When you do that at scale with other people, suddenly you have an economy of value. So in Minecraft, I might collect resources because I enjoy doing it, but there'll be other players that want those resources. In order to navigate that space, we just got into social studies. So the social studies teachers that I studied often found that they were teaching how to make a social contract, how to build a declaration, how to come up with a constitution for play within Minecraft, because they had multiple people that were navigating the same space and they needed to create some sort of civic social etiquette between each other. So they were teaching constitutional law through Minecraft. And I thought that was interesting. Uh, another one is how to teach kids to think for themselves. Teachers reported, and, and when you read this quote, note that teachers didn't, um, uh, this was a positive comment by them. They actually liked the fact that students would open up Minecraft and not know what to do. And they saw that as something where they could break the mold of a student that had been told what to do for years in every classroom they'd encountered. That it was good for a student to encounter a space where they had to think for themselves and they had to create their own goals, they had to decide what a treasure was and seek it out, that that idea of thinking independently was actually a valuable resource for them. So here's what's next for me and then I'll wrap up and we'll take a couple questions um, because Steve's saying I gotta finish up, so I will. Um, here's what's next. I wanna move to looking at how these teachers design. I think we have some answers around what that design looks like. But I'm interested, I studied exemplary teachers. What does this look like for mainstream teachers, the average teacher that isn't necessarily winning an award or known online as a Minecraft teacher? How do we better encourage these kinds of spaces? And how do we help professional support and development based on what we know from exemplary teachers? How do we train all of our teachers that way? So as we move forward into this year, hopefully this time next year, I'll be able to report on a district level initiative where we're trying to do this kind of training an informal one-on-one -on -one training for every teacher in the district and mapping it out on a giant whiteboard to know where every individual teacher is, what they're interested in, and build trusted relationships with them where they can, we can recommend new things to them in a very informal way. So how do we encourage and support that? And, I would, and those of you that are here at this session may be interested in that too. 
um, we need to talk because I want to know what does this look like at scale to train teachers as we know people learn in these digital spaces to do the kinds of things we know are effective. I'll wrap up by saying I think games are good for learning. I think particular games are especially good for particular classroom kinds of learning. And I think there are some games like Minecraft that are particularly interesting because you can do anything with them. They're a blank slate. In that sense, if teachers are designers, I want to put that blank slate in front of them and see what they do and inform the rest of teachers as to what our top teachers are doing with these digital spaces. I think that's a major challenge right ha we have right now. It's a major bottleneck. If we want more games in education, we have to intelligently design training and support for teachers that encourage those things. And I think this is part of how to do it. So thank you very much. Um, and thanks for coming and joining and those of you that are recorded. My email is sdikkers at gmail.com. Let's email, talk. This is a small community. Um, let's have a chat. Um, I don't think we have too much time for questions, but I will answer any that you send via email within a day. Uh, thanks, Allison. Um, but if we did have maybe one question, I don't want to uh, go <laughs> too much further, Pat, but I think I have time for one question, do I not? Well, we do have to give people a chance to take a quick break. If it's I don't okay, want to interrupt the next email. session, which is starting in about four minutes, but job. I think we have a couple I'm minutes so here. So glad to have been here. Uh, but, Sean, let's, let's wrap it up. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Steve. Have a great conference.